Lakeisha, I appreciate you. Um, we have opportunity today to uh, hear from two wonderful papers um, that have been offered to us and to um, engage in this um, in this important work this morning. I'm going to introduce the papers one at a time and offer the team an opportunity to introduce themselves. And we'll hear from them for about 20 minutes and then a second paper I'll introduce. And again, a presentation of about 20 minutes and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. Please do feel free to hold on to those questions. You may need to write them down or feel free to put them in the chat if you want to be sure that you'll remember them and that we take them up at the end uh, in our conversation time. Um, so about an hour, uh, 20 minutes for each presentation and 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, so let's get going. We have opportunity this morning to hear from uh, three amazing scholars. Um, the paper is called Crossed Wires, Misunderstandings from Christian Families and Faith Leaders Regarding the Spiritual Needs and Desires of the Contemporary Family. Uh, Heather, Cheryl, and Hannah, please take it away. Thank you so much, Denise. We are thrilled to be here. I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm Heather Ingersoll. I am the executive director for the Godly Play Foundation. I have a PhD from Seattle Pacific University in education. Um, so I bring that lens to my work, um, but also probably even more importantly, I bring the lens of being a mother of a seven and four-year-old and also having spent many years um, directing programs for spiritual nurture for children in congregations. And I'm Cheryl Miner, joining you with Heather, and I'm the um, director of the Center for the Theology of Childhood at the Godly Clay Foundation. Um, and I have a PhD from North Central University in psychology and an MDiv from Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I am also a priest, an Episcopal priest, and have served a parish here in the Boston area for the past 27 years, um, co-rectors with my spouse. Um, and as Heather said, I'm a parent also, although mine are much older, um, but I have the blessing of being a grandmother to a two-year-old. Hello, everyone. Um... My name is Hannah Sutton Adams. I'm a PhD candidate at Boston College in theology and education. I'm a board certified chaplain and I have the privilege of being the research intern at the God. Great. Um, well, just to undergird our uh, paper and our presentation today and connect it to the theme of the conference, we are obviously talking about whose children are they and um, a theme running through many of the conversations this week has been around the agency of children as um, ones who experience God and spirituality in their own unique ways. Um, but we also know <clears throat> that they are dependent on adults for much of um, creating the space, spaces and cultivating um, the type of ways that children um, engage with and think about their faith. Um, I can imagine many of you can think about an adult, uh, maybe an experience of a, with an adult <clears throat> as a child. Um, that shaped the way maybe you think about God or life or death or yourself. Sometimes those are positive memories and sometimes those can be um, difficult memories. Um, so when we were invited by the Lilly Endowment to explore um, what we might do to support Christian um, parents and caregivers in supporting the spiritual spiritual nurture of their children. We wanted to think about it through that lens that children are living in different um, different uh, cultures. We think about it from the ecological development lens that um, the spaces and places where children at, interact with one another and with the child to shape um, their nurture and development. So this is where our um, papers, crossed wires, comes from. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And share my screen. 
Okay. Does that look good? Okay, great. So we also know that um, there is a decline in participation in Christian faith communities among younger generations, including um, families with children, uh, young children, and that was further exasperated by COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. So there are questions around will families with children um, can associate with or return to Christian faith communities? What does the future of um, the relationship between families with young children and um, Christian faith communities look like? And Christian faith leaders are often asking, uh, what can we do to get the families back? And why are families choosing not to come? What are we doing wrong or what do we need to do differently? So we wanted to dive in to get a bit of a feel for um, some of the nuances and stories behind these questions. So we surveyed and held focus groups with both caregivers, parents and caregivers, and congregational leaders. And ultimately what we discovered was a disconnect between faith leaders and what they, um, how they perceived the experience of contemporary families in the United States and what contemporary families were actually, um, were actually experiencing. So the questions around that, around this sort of identification of contrasting visions was where is the communication breakdown? If, care, if caregivers think nurturing children's spirituality is important, why aren't they participating in faith communities? And how do faith leaders understand this phenomenon and how are they adopting their ministries? I'm gonna invite Hannah to share a bit about the data gathering piece. And Hannah might, <laughs> maybe I'll take it from here. Yeah, she seems to be having connect yep. connection issues. Yeah, yep. Okay, well, I will keep going. So um, as I said, we are, we, for Thank that- you, Heather. Um, yep. Heather Minton, hear me? This was a mixed. I think I'll, mm -hmm. I'll message her that. Okay, I'll go ahead and share this piece. <laughs> so um, we surveyed parents and caregivers. We had 61 online survey responses, and then we hosted five virtual in-person listening and learning sessions. We call these experiment experiential listen and learning sessions in that we took um, a, a semi-structured focus group approach, but also gave them a time in the middle to spend some time um, engaging with their children uh, around a story of our faith using the godly play method, and then came back and um, invited parents and caregivers that were participating to wonder about that. And then we also have post uh, listening and learn session surveys. Um, a few notes about the demographics, 98% of those participating identified as white or Caucasian. Um, certainly, uh, you can tell that we had somewhat of a, a not a hugely diverse <laughs> population. Also, one identified as a single parent, the rest identified as um, co-parenting. Just over 50% reported attending religious services about once a week or several times a week. So fairly active in um, religious services. Denominations represented were Episcopalian, Lutheran, Nazarene, UMC, Presbyterian, UCC, Catholic, and Mennonite. And then with our faith leaders, um, we had 114 participate in the online survey. We had four virtual listen and learn sessions with clergy from various denominations and um, that totaled 25 participants. And then we also hosted two one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews with school chaplains. A brief overview of the faith leader demographics, 55 
um, consider themselves Christian formation directors, either lay or ordained, 10% identified as lead pastors. Um, the congregations they served ranged in size from less than 50 to more than 100, or more than 200, and then 25% were Episcopalian, um, but other denominations represented included Baptist, ELCA, UMC, Nazarene, Interdenominational, and Church of England. So to note, um, there are obviously limitations to this uh, study. It was definitely skewed toward families somewhat connected to Christian communities based on, um, and mostly mainline based on their um, engagement with um, faith communities. A limited sample size, this was limited to North America. Um, the listen and learn sessions were led by proponents of godly play. Um, and then all researchers were in, or are employed by the Godly Play Foundation. So I'll take I'll take it from here. Yeah. So I led the team that uh, worked um, to gather data from the faith leaders, um, and we heard sort of three basic themes. There were some more as well, of course. But as we went through all the data and coded it, these were the things that rose to the top. So of course, concern about family commitment. Um, and uh, or a lack of commitment to uh, religious communities, um, lack of engagement with the local faith community, all of that. Um, anxiety about the lack of family participation, and I'll say more about that as we go on, and just exhaustion and burnout as they struggle to figure out what families really need. So we'll go a little deeper into some of these. As I said, there was this sense that uh, families are not um, as committed as they might have been in the past. Um, and so there was just a lot of concern about that. You know, the usual topics came up, you know, the, oh, they're, they're, they care more about sports or birthday parties. Um, they just don't care. They're not committed. Um, they're busy with other things. You see some of the quotes here that we pulled out from the surveys. Um, and, and I think their sense was that, um, that that the lack of attendance really equaled disinterest in uh, things of a spiritual nature. Um, that was kind of the across the board understanding. Um, and then, you know, there was kind of a, a subtext too. There, that because families aren't aren't committed, um, there was a real decrease in volunteer availability, and so programs were struggling to even staff um, a regular Sunday school program because they didn't have anybody to ask to teach those those programs. And, and then, as I said, there was this anxiety and exhaustion and real burnout um, amongst them. One of the stories I remember is a colleague of mine saying, you know, after COVID, you know, the families weren't coming back. So we tried this huge creative night where we invited everybody to come and there was going to be food and there was going to be a, 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 a I don't know, a bouncy house for the kids, you know, all kinds of things, you know, how people try to pull out all the stops. And he said, we opened the doors and no one came. And so I just, I'm, I'm done. He said, I just give up. I can't do this anymore. Um, if, mm -hmm. if my church wants to have children, then they're going to have to hire somebody because I can't manage this. Um, so th I think there is some real anxiety about the future of the church. What's going to happen to the church as, as we see this decline continue over and over year over year um, and anxiety about their jobs um, that sort of thing as well. And then they're, they're just working so hard, right? They're throwing programs out there like spaghetti on the wall, you know, to see what might stick. And they're so creative, right? They're really creative um, and, and nothing seems to be working. And they just are, what, what do families want? What do families need? Um, and then they have some real concerns too about the children, right? It's not just about themselves and the church and the longevity of the church. They're, they're worried about the children. They care about the children and wonder what's gonna happen to their sense of spiritual well-being if they're disconnected from a faith community. So I think- about that. Oh, there she yeah. is, yeah. I think Thank she's you, gonna Sarah. try, yeah. Yeah, I'll try camera off, I apologize. Um, so we did a similar analysis with the data we received from parents. Um, you'll notice that in the paper, we use the term caregivers. 
our original intent was to talk to anyone who considered themselves a caregiver to a child that inhabited or partially inhabited the same space as them. Everyone we talked to ended up being parents. So that's why you'll notice the shift in the language here. So we'll review the four themes that we found. The first one is that parents really expressed a desire to provide a spiritually nurturing home. We heard parents reflecting on the hopes and dreams for their children's spirituality. That can be summarized as they want their children to know that they're inherently worthy and valuable as children of God, and also wanting the children to feel a sense of connectedness, be that to themselves, to others, to nature, and to God. Uh, this quote here summarizes nicely what we heard in this theme, and that that is that my child knows himself treasured, loved, deeply known, and safe. A strong desire to spiritually nurture um, the internal lives of children. Secondly, we heard um, a lot of concerns about life, and we labeled this temporary life concerns because there was a large range of things that parents expressed frustration or stress over. So one of those is time, not having enough time to spend with children, not having enough time to spend on themselves, to wrestle and to think. Concerns about their own past trauma and their children who've just lived through the trauma of COVID-19. Financial worries, their own or their child's mental health concerns. Another one that we'll talk about more in depth in a bit is faith shifts. Parents themselves being worried that they are not adequately equipped to nurture the child's spirituality. And then just a sense of overall exhaustion after the pandemic, after so many different personal experiences, all of that culminating to really create a sense of exhaustion. Just a couple of quotes on the other side, summarize these nicely, such as, I have trouble balancing work and taking care of my child, or even concerns about modern day technology like navigating social media with the soon to be. We heard caregivers expressing a felt lack of connection, be that with a faith community or just other people. So Heather mentioned this previously, and our intent was to talk to folks who are sort of on the margins of Christian communities. And we did end up talking to those people who had some, but maybe some connection, but a feeling of disconnection with the local church or their local congregation. So there was speak of social and ideological isolation and expressed void in the caregivers' own lives that they were concerned about their children also experiencing. The first quote, although quite gut-wrenching, summarizes this, no support, no family, no faith community, few friends. Or the second one, nobody. We have nobody. It's extremely discouraging. I'd love to be part of a faith community that could be a second family. So again, that longing to be a part of, but also the recognition of this void of a lack of action. And finally, the fourth thing you can read about in our paper talks about uh, the faith leaders own spiritual and religious questioning. So not only is there ideological or social isolation, but also spiritual isolation. Many of the parents described a conflicted relationship with the religious institutions or organized religion in general and their own spirituality. Most of these folks did have some connection still to a local congregation or a faith community, but there was a, a, a gap between how they perceived of themselves and the religious institutions that they were not nominally affiliated with. Their own spiritual concerns led many of these parents to express concerns about their own ability to nurture their children's spirituality. Um, so this first quote really explains that quite nicely. Uh, this parent said, when we asked, you know, what are you concerned about? What are, what are your, your concern when it comes to nurturing your children's spirituality? They said, trying to impart knowledge or answering questions when I'm going through my own faith shift. So in other words, trying to maintain one's spirituality, wrestle perhaps with some difficult things, and also be available to the child to answer questions 
or to sit with them in their questions. And then finally, we heard that many of these parents are suspicious of provided religious education. So though the congregation or the parish may offer a program, parents would sometimes reflect on their own negative experiences when they were children in these similar types of programs and did not want their children to experience similar things. So there was an overall suspicion of what is available, all of these wonderful creative things faith leaders might be doing still might be cause for concern for the parents. So what, what would be helpful? Where do we go from here? I think Cheryl's gonna jump back in. Yeah, so as we um, sort of looked at all of the data and this disconnect that we saw between um, families and caregivers, we said, well, where, where is a place to begin? And we think the best place, of course, is where there are some shared values. Um, so we name them here, uh, you know, their mutual concerns regarding spirituality, though they maybe emphasize slightly different things um, for the church leaders. You know, it's going to look like regular participation in the institution, and maybe it will look differently for the families. But both of them um, realize that this is an important value. Um, and then both are feeling stressed, fatigued, and burned out, right? So on both sides of the equation, the parents and the leaders from the congregations. Um, and then an awareness of uh, the mismatch between the contemporary reality. The parents know how busy life is. They know they're running as fast as they can just to keep body and soul together. And, um, and, and yet they think they want more, but how in the world are they going to fit more when they're so busy already. And I think the congregation well, leaders are very aware of the same thing. Um, so what, what might be the next step? Um, you know, one of the things that we've been dreaming about is um, how we could step in as an organization, the Godly Play Foundation, and, um, and help in this situation. Um, and so I'm gonna let Heather talk a little bit about what we're thinking about. So yeah, finally, in summarizing all of this, um, we run the risk of like going to that quick programmatic fix. And we are really um, trying, it's hard not to do that and not to invite others to do that. But some of the things that we're just um, reflecting on, inviting others to reflect on are how to prioritize relationships and connections rather than programmatic fixes, providing space for caregivers to explore their own spirituality, in a community that feels safe and um, inviting to them and removing the pressure for caregivers to act as religious educators, but focus on really an embedded, integrated um, family spirituality and inviting them to consider what that looks like in their, um, in their very busy and full lives. How is it not just parents now are kind of being asked to teach their children, but um, instead of integrating ideas of faith and spirituality into their way of being together. I will end there. Um, yeah, look forward to more discussion about this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that engaging um, presentation. So much from this that we can draw. I want to. I want to turn our attention now to the second paper um, offered uh, to us by two, two um, distinguished colleagues as well. Uh, engaging story linking through conversations between mother and daughter, explorations in matriarchal biblical hermeneutics and Christian religious education. Jennifer and Rena, please, will you introduce yourselves? And then the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Denise, for this wonderful opportunity. Let me first introduce myself, um, and then uh, Rena will take turn. Uh, for me, as a blessed mother and wife, I'm pursuing my PhD in religious education at Fordham uh, University, um, especially from Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education. I'm teaching now also as an assistant professor in Christian religious education at the Faculty of Theology, Universitas Kristen Dutawacana from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. 
uh, before I pursued my MA in Christian Education at Presbyterian University and Theological Seminary in Seoul, South Korea. And I'm serving now also as a pastor of the Protestant Church in Western Indonesia. And my research interest now is related to femicide issues, family memory studies, and transgenerational approach in Christian religious education. Thank you. Rena? Yes, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Rena Cesaria Yudita. I'm blessed with um, football athlete player. <laughs> my first son is uh, 13 years old now, and my second born is a um, princess, likes to dance, uh, eight-year girl. Uh, I'm, I'm a pastor of Gerejo Kristen Jawiwetan, uh, East, Christian, uh, East Java Christian Church. Uh, I've been ordained as a pastor for 13 years now, and I also uh, serve as a lecturer in, I'm a faculty member in a uh, faculty of uh, theology in, in the same university as uh, Jennifer, uh, Universitas Kristen Duta Wacana at Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And now I'm pursuing my doctoral degree. I'm a PhD candidate in TTC, Trinity Theological College in Singapore. So that is why I have to uh, do my, my study away from uh, my family in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, I hold MTH from PTHU, Protestant Theological University, Kampen in, in the Netherlands. Um, I think that's all. Oh, my research now related to uh, sexuality, women's sexuality in Pauline theology. So uh, honestly, I'm not, I'm not um, religious uh, Christian education, my field, but my field is in uh, New Testament or in the biblical studies. Thank you. And let me share our PowerPoint. Okay, uh, this is our article titled Engaging Story Linking Through Conversation Between Mother and Daughter, Exploration in Matriarchal Biblical Hermeneutics and Christian Religious Education. So what we are doing is something like um, interdisciplinary studies here between biblical studies and a Christian religious education. This is the abstract of our paper. This collaborative autobiographical narrative inquiry through ethnography seeks to engage the voices of mothers and daughters, which have often been silenced by the autocracy of patriarchy. Conversation between mothers and daughters are important spaces for hearing about experiences of faith. They provide transformative power, not only for women and girls, but also for the church and society. These articles explore the author's experiences as mothers in the context of patriarchal culture. In their struggle to be heard and recognized, the authors recount their feeling of God's presence and support in everyday interaction with their daughters that include conversation touching upon different aspects of theology. These conversations engage story linking through the practice of re-listening and retelling Christian faith stories in the Bible and inherited within church tradition to promote a life-giving approach in transformative learning. In this process, there are exploration in matriarchal biblical hermeneutics and Christian religious education. By reflecting on this conversation, this study contributes to Christian religious education in the family, family context, and transformation into church and society. The aim of this paper is to explore deeper into the significance of supporting the voices of mothers and daughters in both the church and society. We will draw from personal experiences and conversation with our daughters. This research proposes two critical questions. The first one is, how can God's presence and support be experienced through the ordinary conversation that takes place between mothers and daughters? And the second one is, how can engagement with story linking through conversation between mothers and daughters become transformative for families, churches, and society 
especially in settings where patriarchy still prevails. This study is an attempt to apply the concept of story linking proposed by uh, Wimberly in the Indonesian Mother's Daughters Conversation. It is an effort to listen to the voices of mothers and daughters in a family setting where the link between personal stories and Christian faith stories allows the presence of God to be experienced in a tangible conversational way. This is about story linking. Conversation between mother and child in the daily life influence their relationship with God. Therefore, this kind of conversation can be categorized as a spiritual conversation. The idea of story linking comes from Wimberley. In the context of African-American Christian education, Wimberley sets out four primary phases in the story linking process. First, engaging the everyday story and then engaging the Christian faith story in the Bible. Next, engaging Christian faith story from the African-American or church local heritage. And the last is engaging in Christian ethical decision making. Story linking emphasizes the importance of compassionate listening. In this process, we need to create moments for listening, safe and comfortable spaces that are also nurturing spaces. In our article, we apply these four phases of Wimberley's ideas of story linking through four phases of engaging to everyday story through conversation. This is our research method. We employ collaborative autobiographical narrative inquiry as our chosen methodology. You can read it further in our articles. This is the first phase of our research, experiencing God's presence through conversation with our daughters. As the authors, we have similarities. We are mothers, pastors, leaders, and lecturers. Now we are pursuing doctoral studies I'm in Singapore and uh, Jennifer in United States with different areas of expertise, New Testament or biblical studies and Christian religious education. And we face similar challenges, working husbands, and we also facing the patriarchal world. And we also often exhausted by the expectation of our working and ministerial in environment. The multiple roles both we and our spouses occupy reflect the lives of today's young adult families, including the complexities and dilemmas they, they face. Amid the situation, conversation with our daughter can be categorized as theological conversation or God talk. This kind of God talk is a treasure that we cherish in the midst of a patriarchal culture. The relationship the between a mother and daughter also has a transformative effect that contributes to religious formation and education within the family. This educative aspect can be seen in two conversations transcribed below. My second daughter is five years old. She is a very active child and likes to tell stories. Once she asked me, mommy, how do I know that God exists? I cannot see God. Then she continued, have you ever met God? If you've never met God, I suggest you don't become a pastor anymore. I just smiled at her words. Honestly, there are times when I cannot answer her question directly. A few days later, I was encouraging her to play with her three-year-old brother. He's my youngest child. It was nighttime and suddenly the lights went out. My youngest son cried and said he was scared. His sister replied, don't be afraid. God will take care of us. My son replied, where is God? My daughter replied, God is in our hearts by pointing to her chest. Again, I smiled. Then I asked my daughter, you said before that you have never seen God. How do you know God is watching over you and in your heart now? She replied like this, yes, actually God was in heaven before, so I couldn't see God yet. But after that, God moved in my heart. I became increasingly interested in the explanation, so I asked again, how do you know God is in your heart? She replied, when I was at school and taking gym class, I was running and I felt my heart dancing, yeah, like, you know, heartbeat. And then I told my teacher that my heart was dancing. My teacher said, if my heart is dancing, it means my heart is beating 
and I'm healthy. If my heart doesn't beat, I could be seriously ill or even die. I was getting more curious now. I don't understand. What does your heart beating have to do with God who is in your heart? My daughter replied, I know if my heart beats, it must be because God makes it. God is in my heart. I replied then, why does God do that? I asked again. She smiled confidently and said, because God loves and keeps me healthy. I think this conversation was an insightful inquiry into faith and theology for a five-year-old. For me, it was inspiring. My daughter reminded me that despite the struggles and challenges of everyday life, God is present even though we don't often sense that presence. My conversation with her made me feel the presence of God. And my eight-year-old daughter is having difficult time coping with our separation caused by my studying abroad. She has always been more attached to me physically than her older brother. Despite our many discussion and deep talks as a family, she still resisted and didn't want me to go. Even a day before my departure, she prayed that I would miss my flight so that I couldn't go. It was a long and emotional goodbye at the airport with lots of hugging and crying. But after that day, we made sure to video call every day so that we could stay connected. Once we had a before sleep video call and she asked me in tears, mommy, why are you leaving me? Is it because you are a pastor? Please stop working as a pastor, be a dentist instead. I honestly felt like crying and laughing at the same time. I didn't know how she came up with that idea. Trying to be calm, I asked what the problem was with being a pastor. She replied with more tears. As a pastor, God is your boss and you cannot refuse God's command to leave me. Then I joined her in tears. I have to admit that I could, I could not offer any explanation at that time. So I just said, I'm sorry for leaving you and stayed with her until she fell asleep. On another occasion, I asked her again about me being a pastor. This time, her response was, Mom, I don't mind being a pastor's daughter. I asked further why she had changed her mind. She replied, I know that God is good. God has chosen you and me only because God is good. So I'm good with that too. Lah. This simple yet profound conversation with my daughter reminds me of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4.1, where he says that Christian ministry comes from the mercy of God. This conversation also made me realize that the relationship between mother and daughter is special and enriches us in many ways, including spiritually. This reflection strengthened me when I separated from my family while carrying out my doctoral studies. So this conversation helped us to realize that having conversation with our daughters in a natural setting of love and trust allows us to feel God's presence and support through mutual exploration. Through this, to, through this process, we can experience the moment of Emmanuel, God with us. And this is the second phase, engaging matriarchal biblical hermeneutics, viewing the Syrophoenician women's story in Mark 7, 24, 30 through a mother's eyes. Viewing a biblical passage through a mother's eyes means examining various aspects of the story as part of matriarchal biblical hermeneutics. This perspective used in the second phase allows us to connect with our experiences, emotion, and insights about being a mother of a daughter. In our opinion, this matricentric hermeneutics is important to the resistance evolved our reading of the text intends to support. Our connection and conversation with our daughters, making the interpretation of the biblical story more relevant to life. Through conversation with our daughters, our eyes have been conditioned by theirs. What Jesus actually valued in this passage was not her pistis, it's not her faith, but the woman's reply, logos. Her courage to push the boundaries raises a question, how could she do this? However, her reaction were unlikely to have solely derived from faith in Jesus, as she had never met Jesus before. On the contrary, it would appear that her actions were prompted by the fact that she could not bear to see her daughter suffer any longer. This story thus highlights a mother's 
protective instinct and unyielding love. Although the passage doesn't give any details about their interaction or conversations, the mother undoubtedly had a profound connection with her daughter. We could even say they were joined by an invisible conversation. This type of conversation is often devalued because patriarchal culture tends to prioritize reason over intuition, intuition or emotion. And the voice of a sick daughter would be considered insignificant in the culture of that time. However, this invisible conversation gives extraordinary power to the mother to act and build a relationship with Jesus for her daughter's healing. The daughter's the daughter is the source of her mother's courage to push past the prevailing boundaries. Reading this passage from a mother perspective highlights uh, several aspects that are not worthy for Christian religious education and family ministry. First point is the daughter's healing is strongly related to the pagan mother's persistent faith and ability to hear and respond to her daughter. Next, the relationship between the mother and her daughter also transforms Jesus' mission. The dogmatic rigidity that Jesus displayed stemmed from the exclusivity of Jewish community at that time. And the last one, the loving relationship and conversation between mother and her daughter, however, breaks down religious barriers that cannot be dismantled in any other way. It opens up a space to hear and respond to others, a space where God's healing power can be experience. This is the church base. The story linking process seeks to engage Christian faith stories from the ASEAN heritage, including their implementation in the Indonesian context. In the ASEAN context, Hope Anton, a religious educator from the Philippines, has expressed the importance of meal table sharing or conversation in the context of ASEAN societies. Anton's idea inspired us to reflect more deeply on the relationality that emerges from eating and drinking together in the church through the sacrament of Holy Communion. This sacrament is supposed to be a symbol of table hospitality, which involves greetings, conversation, eating, and drinking together. However, several church synods in Indonesia still do not allow children to take part. Why do we go to church together? But when there is a sacrament of Holy Communion, how come I'm not allowed to join you and that? Am I not holy? We are family. That was the question of the daughter of one author four years ago. Holy Communion, which should have been full of joy, made her mother feel uncomfortable, both as a mother and a pastor. And her daughter's statement continues to sound in the author's ears to this day. The practice of Holy Communion doesn't allow the involvement of children because of the standard church dogma that has been passed down from generation to generation. Due to constraints of space, the authors will not explain in detail the background and history of the churches in Indonesia. But however, it will suffice to say that the broader Christian tradition provides a space for children's involvement in Holy Communion. Even conversations with children play an important role in this tradition. For example, Jewish Passover or Seder in the Old Testament and the Last Supper. In the analysis, we also use the thinking from two Christian religious educators. You can see in our article from Tabitha Kartikal Christiani and also from Jerome W. Berryman. The sacrament of Holy Communion exhibits characteristic of the kingdom of God. It follows that this sacrament has a strong connection with children. And this is the fourth piece of story linking. Hope and wisdom for a transformed Christian education in the context of family life is explored in this part. Based on our conversations with our daughters, we feel amazed at God's presence and support in these interactions. We can see God's grace in the growing faith of our children. Through these conversations, we are also able to really listen and retell the biblical stories and church inherited traditions. From these experiences, we conclude that motherhood is significant in children's spiritual development. A child's concept of God is related to their experiences of interacting with adults, most of which takes place in everyday relationships at home. Churches thus need to provide space for family empowerment so that faith can grow and strengthen relationship between children and their parents, including mothers and daughters. 
spaces for collaborative interactions among women themselves are also important so they can encourage each other. For this reason, it is important to pay attention to Christian religious education for children, especially in the family through informal interactions. This process of including children and the marginalized in church and family practices is the hope for realizing justice and equality in the context of a society that is dominated by a patriarchal culture. Janice Knight calls this process transformative listening as part of transformative learning. In this part, we also use some insights from Carol Gilligan and Bell Hawks to complete our understanding in this study. This is our last uh, slide. The hope for the transformation of families and churches depends on the spirit of inclusivity, which must also extend to the sacrament of the Holy Communion, especially in Indonesian context, so that it can continue to be life-giving for all people, adults and children, as well as those who have been marginalized by society. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Will you please join me in either virtual or actual applause for our present presenters this morning? Thank you. Thank you so much. What a rich feast you have set before us. I want to invite uh, any from our group uh, who've been in, in engaging this uh, conversation. If you have questions, please, will you Unmute and ask your question or put it in the chat if you'd like us to voice it for you. I wonder if the presenters, while we're waiting for questions from others, if the presenters have uh, questions for each other, if you see interaction between the pre uh, presentations that each of you made. I'm happy to jump in and say something. I when, one of the things I heard in their paper um, was that um, the, that they were in a sense equipped to uh, be present to their children as those questions arose, perhaps because of their education and their background and their 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 role as pastors. Um, and um, I think that's part part of what we were hearing in our study is parents do not feel equipped, right? That children raise these questions and there's there's um, some anxiety about feeling like I'm able to do that. What, um, I think it was um, uh, Rena's story where she said she was able to just kind of sit with the question or was that Jennifer? I'm not sure which one and not try to answer her daughter's question that 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 showed a great wisdom on her part to just kind of sit, let, let just sit with her in that question about who is God? And um, so I just want to raise that up that one of our goals is to try to find some ways to um, to help parents feel more confident and better equipped um, to engage in that kind of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually better equipped. I mean, part of the part of the issue is I mean, for for parents who feel ill equipped, sometimes they actually are ill-equipped. Exactly. It's need, kind of right? yeah, lifting up, you know, the fact that you don't really need to have all the answers. It's okay to, to just be in the question with your children. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate that. Any others? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. Um, it was a great art for me, quotation mark, because, you know, uh, listening uh, your children your children amid you know overload con situation and also based on your presentation um it takes uh more and more uh time and we need the art of uh ability to listen especially our children with their ongoing questions every day and i think uh this is also related with your presentation when you mentioned about the shared values. You mentioned about the mutual concerns regarding spirituality. And even though I need to acknowledge that Indonesian context is not the same, there is no uh, anxiety about lack of family participation. But still, we need to give a space for the voiceless to voice. and. Um, this is part of try to uh, prioritize relationship and connections rather than programming uh, many, many things in our church. And uh, I think starting from the family is also a 
kind of connection between our presentations uh, today. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate you. your presentation also. Thank you. I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat, um, and I'm going to take them in the order that I saw them. Um, Mary Love says, if parents are ill-equipped, how intentional are congregations in providing ministry to parents? Um, if, if anyone wants to take that one on, um, <laughs> otherwise I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep asking the, the questions from the chat. Another another question raised. I didn't hear the description of patriarchy. Did patriarchy interfere with this mother-daughter interaction in religious education? Rena or Jennifer, would you like to, to take that one on? Yeah, Rena, do you want to jump in? Actually, in our paper, in our paper, there is a kind of full explanation about the patriarchy situation, how our husband also face difficulties when they support us to pursue doctoral degrees. Yeah, it's higher than their education level, educational level. Yeah, it's only one example, but there's some examples in our paper. Uh, you can see in our paper, but Rena, do you want to add more? We cannot hear your voice, Rena. Hmm. Still yeah. not. I'm so sorry. Did you, any, <laughs> did you take out anything in your ears or did you have headphones on or anything? Yeah, try that now. You have to, can you unmute again and try? Yes, try yes, now? yes. Can, can there you, you hear go. Me now? We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe I only have one note to, uh, to add. Uh, patriarchal. Um, patriarchal um, situation in Indonesia also uh, not only, how to say, not only oppress uh, the women's side, but also uh, our husband, just like what Jennifer said before. Uh, somehow it's still uncommon for Indonesian to see uh, a husband or a man involved in the domestic, uh, domestic area, like in the kitchen or such, or, or um, interfere with, with, with um, parenting. So uh, somehow, even though our our husband is very um, um, very supportive to our uh, to our studies to our ministry, moreover, like Jennifer's husband is um, pastor also, but my husband is civil servant. But but they are very supportive. Um, they don't mind to to help us in our uh, domestic area. But the problem is not only uh, between me and my husband with between us and our husband but also uh, from the um, from the society yeah that that is the patriarchal uh, situation that we're talking about i will add a little a little bit this is sure. a famous quote expresses our situation mm. uh, and the dilemma women yeah. are supposed to work like they don't have children and raise children as if they don't work. Yeah, it's so familiar in Indonesia. Mm. Yeah. And you can read it. It's almost <laughs> impossible uh, to fulfill <laughs> that kind of quote. <laughs> well put, well put. <laughs> yeah, our condition now to, to present our paper as a doctoral student, you know, it's very rare. And our husband is taking care of our children. Sometimes society just, uh, see them in the very low level right right i'm gonna just lift up a couple of comments from the chat um john falcone says it's listening to stories like these from pastor mothers like reina and uh, jennifer that can help parents to see what good spiritual conversations with their children look like and i think um offering that modeling right, is an important part of, um, of how we help parents envision what their role could be. Uh, Karen Marie offers, in the first paper, she noted they, they cited from Smith that parents want religion to provide moral values, but then they look at religion as being rigid and judgmental. So 
you know, sort of a catch 22. Um, how well does, um, does that happen? Uh, Hannah would like to speak to Mary Love's question. Hannah, please. Uh, Hannah Sutton Adams, go ahead. Thank you, Denise. Sorry, it's, it's hard to get someone's attention when you're not on camera. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, Mary, thank you for your question. I noticed that you commented, um, you know, what are churches doing, in other words, if parents are inadequate? I want to say from our perspective in the study, we did not make any sort of qualitative judgment about how effective or ineffective parents are. Where we got this idea that parents feel inadequate is from their own experiences. So whether they actually are or are not, that's not something that we can say. But what we can say is that parents do not feel equipped. Um, I think most of us thinking from a godly play framework think that parents are quite equipped, especially when given the skills and the space and the time to sit with their children and using tools like wondering. So our particular project is going to be thinking about how to equip parents or how to, how to equip is not even necessarily the right word, but how to naturally engage with people's resources that they already have inside themselves to be present to their children spiritually. I don't know if Heather or Cheryl have anything else they'd like to add to that. I just wanted to add sort of noting um, Karen Marie's comments about Smith's uh, paper and book about um, Christian parenting and the sort of what he identified as parenting seeing or parents seeing religion as um, important for providing moral values and helping their children to become good people. Citing, you know, his research and some other research, we anticipated hearing that from parents. Um, and we actually didn't. Uh, we didn't when we were at when we asked them um, about their hopes and their dreams for their children's spirituality and their connection to the church. Um, there was this idea that they wanted them to be moral and good people. And that was what religion was for, was not, um, did not uh, emerge in the data. So I think it might be an interesting time for researchers to really re relook at this. Um, perhaps there have been some societal shifts, perhaps COVID-19 have shifted some priorities of families. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that that piece. And with that, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring our time to a close. Um, the, there are plenty more great questions in the chat and some really important um, cultural uh, questions. I want us to pay attention to those and maybe come back and watch the video. Uh, Lakeisha, is there more that you wanted to say as we conclude? Nope, just that I'm going to be putting the, uh, the feedback link in the chat right now. So feel free to fill out the feedback. Excellent. And thank you so much to our presenters. Will you join me in thanking them once more? Appreciate you all. Please do take time for the feedback. Great presentations. Thank you to all of you.